Was your New Year's resolution to help an angry Canadian achieve his dream of being an entertainer for a living? If so, then do I have the website for you. Support the habit at patreon.com slash dose of Buckley. The fact that I've talked about Taylor Swift like once a year for the last 12 years is a testament to the longevity of her career. Over the years, I usually try and discuss people who are topical, culturally important, socially relevant. You certainly don't hear me talking about Flo Rida anymore. A few artists can say that in a career lasting more than 10 years, they managed to continue to be as popular as they once were. Right, Kesha? But Taylor Swift has managed to be a major figure in pop culture for 16 years. And yes, because of that, Taylor's appeared on my worst songs list five times, in 2011, 2013, 2014, 2017, and taking the top spot in 2019. I've also autopsied three of her songs, in 2012, 2017, and 2020. And I mocked her a few years ago for trying to copyright phrases she didn't make up and last year for releasing eight copies of the same album with different cover arts to milk her fans for every last dollar they have. Which was met with a bunch of people going, she's not forcing them to. Which, sure, she's not. She's not holding a gun to their head. Just like a PS5 scalper isn't forcing you to buy one for a thousand dollars, but they're still scumbags. Anyway, Perhaps for the first time in 12 years of discussing Taylor Swift's music and career, I'm actually going to defend her. Late last year, Taylor Swift released Red, Taylor's Version, a re-recording of her 2012 album. This was a follow-up to her April release of Fearless, Taylor's Version, which of course was a re-recording of her 2008 album. A few people have reached out to me, including someone on Reddit, to ask me, do I think this is another cash grab, like releasing eight album covers and hoodies with a word on them for absurd amounts of money? And the answer is, yes. But... <laughs> First, let's talk about why Taylor Swift is doing this, because it's actually kind of funny. So a few years back, she left her original label, Big Machine Records, to sign with Republic Records, a division of Universal Music. Now, here's where the fun begins. Big Machine, now effectively without its biggest star, goes up for sale and is purchased by Ithaca Holdings, a company owned by Scooter Braun. Scooter, if you don't know, is Justin Bieber and Ariana Grande's manager and owns a couple of record labels. He's also an adult man who prefers to be called Scooter. Taylor Swift and Boot Scooter Boogie haven't always got along, and so Taylor was apparently furious that Big Machine was sold to him. Why? She's not there anymore. Nothing to do with her, right? Well, Big Machine still owned all the masters of her music, and all the rights to do whatever the fuck they want with said masters. This is what happens when you make record deals when you're like 15 years old, not knowing that you'd become one of the biggest fucking artists in the whole world. So now her entire catalog is owned by her greatest enemy. Taylor has since claimed that she tried to buy the rights to her songs back when she left, and that she didn't know that all of her music was going to be sold to Scooty Puff Jr. Scott Borchetta, founder of Big Machine, said, First off, I texted you the night before, so you did know. And second, we tried to give her the rights back to her music. All she had to do was just re-sign with us for 10 years. Except, if you read what Scott posted as proof of this, it wouldn't really have given her the rights to her music. The proposal mentioned several times that any usage of the songs would still be exclusive to Big Machine, and any contracts that already existed would have to be honored. So he doesn't refute that Taylor wanted to leave the label, purchase the rights to all her music outright, and Big Machine said no. Because of course they said no! That's all they've got! The rest of their roster includes Florida Georgia Line, Tim McGraw, Sugarland, the group formerly known as Lady Antebellum, and a dozen other country nobodies. Those four artists combined probably haven't sold even a fraction of as many albums as Taylor Swift has during her career. In fact, it's possible that Taylor Swift has generated more money for Big Machine than all of their other artists combined. Selling Taylor Swift's catalog to her would have been like selling the engine, steering wheel, and driver's seat of a 67 Corvette separately, and then trying to sell the rest of the car to someone else. Good luck finding a buyer that's going to pay top dollar. 
No, Razor Scooter never would have bought Big Machine for $300 million without the Taylor Swift catalog. He likely wouldn't have had any interest at all. So Taylor says, fuck this shit, I have publishing rights on my songs. More on that in a second. So I'm just gonna re-record all of them, re-release them, and then hopefully companies will just come to me directly anytime they wanna license my music. And my fans will just stream those versions instead. So your versions of my songs will be worthless. Rug Scooter says, you're bluffing, and then tries to make all these other deals with her. And Taylor's like, no, I don't want those deals. Sell me back my songs with no strings attached. And Scooter says, ah, oh, fuck this. I'm selling them to someone else. And sells the rights to her first six albums for $300 million, the same price he paid for the entirety of Big Machine Records, to a company called Shamrock Holdings, a private investment firm owned by the Disney family. Yes, that Disney family. And does so under the condition that he still gets to earn from those masters. Shamrock Holdings goes, Oh, hey Taylor, you want to become an equity partner? And Taylor goes, No, Pooper Scooper will still be earning off my work. No, I'm re-recording all my albums. I told you I'm going to do that. You'll be lucky to sell my shit for $300 once I'm done. I mean, I'm probably heavily paraphrasing, but anyway, how can Taylor do this? Because, as the main songwriter for all of her songs, she owns the publishing rights. This means she owns the lyrics and the musical composition, the sheet music, just not the recorded finished products. So, she legally can just re-record everything she's ever done, word for word, note for note, and then she does own these particular masters. Then, if, say, a company wanted to use one of her songs in a commercial or a movie or something, she can go, Hey, I'll give you a better deal than Scooter or Shamrock will. Or, companies might just choose to go to her directly because, if they don't, Taylor Swift's insanely rabid and incredibly annoying fan base will likely go all Cujo on Twitter and threaten to boycott whatever product or movie uses the original version. Already, iHeartRadio, owner of over 800 radio stations in the US, has said that they will be switching to using Taylor's versions as they are re-recorded. And Universal, Taylor's current label, has seen this as such a threat that they're putting it into new artist contracts they are not allowed to re-record their own music for a much longer period of time. So, I actually have to side with Taylor Swift on this one. Is it mostly about money? Sure, yeah. Both of her re-recorded albums hit number one on the Billboard 200 and have moved nearly half a million units each. She's probably making more money from these decade-plus old albums than she has in years. For example, how much money could You Belong With Me or We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together have possibly made in 2020, right? And she said in a recent interview when asked if, while recording these songs, what the subjects of those songs, her exes, might feel about them being released again, if it's easier or worse for them 10 years later. And Taylor said, I haven't thought about their experience, to be honest. Because she doesn't care how they feel. Of course she doesn't. This is all about her. She admits that the emotion that led to the creation of those songs in the first place isn't there while performing them anymore. So really, she's just singing words she wrote a decade ago so she can own the rights to some songs and make all the money off them. But, as a creator, I know I'd be pissed if I didn't own my own work. If someone else owned all my content and was like, Ah, oh, no, you can't say I'm Buckley and you're welcome, or this is Musical Autopsy, bag it and tag it anymore. We own those. We're gonna put them on shirts, and you won't get a fucking dime from it. I mean, they wouldn't get a dime from it either. Using me isn't a great example. I think I've sold $400 worth of merch my entire life. But I've spent 12 years creating all this stuff. It's mine. And if some other fucker could just come along and start leeching off me or having a say in how and where my videos get distributed or where the recordings of my voice can be used, that would be pretty shitty. So Taylor, I'm with you on this one. I mean, I still think the songs are hot dog shit on a cold sidewalk, but I respect your right to own both the dog shit and the sidewalk. Plus, again, in any argument, how do you ever side with an adult man named Scooter?